welcome to The Velocity of Now. My name is Thomas Sheridan, and this is my new weekly radio show exclusively on Type 1 Radio Network every Sunday between 7 and 9 p.m. GMT. And I want to th thank the people at Type 1 Radio for giving me the privilege of being on this show and being on this network and presenting it, and also thanking them for doing the production work so I can concentrate exclusively on the content and hopefully in the weeks and months to come, entertain, inform, give insight, educate, and not take ourselves too seriously. Because that's what they want. That's what the, the control system wants. They want us in constant fear and constant anxieties. They do not want us laughing at them. They do not want us laughing at the absurdities of their existence, of their plans, and their behavior. Because ultimately, when you strip it down to its basic core, we're dealing with lunatics running the world. Some are psychopaths, but nearly all are lunatics because you cannot be sane and be part of this system that they foisted upon us and then believe, have us believe that this is natural, this is normal. So anyway, I want to thank you again. My website is, uh, I thank you again for coming here. Well, my website again is thomassheridanarts.com. And there's a link there to the web, to the radio show. You'll see it, the velocity of now on the home page. If you click on that, I will also put in details of what the show is about after it's finished and also some of the bands we have on here, performers, singers, because I also want to use this as a platform to sort of take away the power that the, the mainstream has in controlling culture. Anyone who knows me knows I'm not particularly fond of people like Simon Kell. And Louis Walsh, I got a standing ovation in Scotland for calling them the, the spawn of Satan. And I will never retract that because these people are actually damaging culture. Simon Kell is the Agenda 21 of culture and bands, performers, singers, musicians are being held back by it. So hopefully this show will give people that deserve it a platform. I started a thread on my Facebook page and many of you sent me just unbelievably good stuff. In fact, there wasn't a bad tune there. And the producers of the show have picked three, which we will play tonight, and they'll be played as the show progresses, and congratulations for being picked, and, you know, thank you to ones who weren't picked, but even by putting yourself on the tread, you have uh, gotten great exposure, because the tread excited a lot of people, and it's just, it's well worth just entering. So uh, I'll start another thread on Monday for so bands, singers, performers, comedians, rappers, poets, hip-hop artists, whatever you want. Once it's recorded in good quality, and uh, it's up on SoundCloud or YouTube. If you put it on SoundCloud, please make sure that the download the download section is enabled because we had one band this week that didn't make it because they didn't get the download button in time. So that's important, and so that's something I'm really excited about because culture and art and creativity is the way out of this. I really do believe this. It's the way out of this mess because we can do something the psychopaths cannot do. The psychopaths cannot create. They can plagiarize, they can be devious, they can co-opt, they can manipulate, and they can steal, but they cannot create new creative intentions. And that's what the universe is. It, what was it Degas said? With every time a painter paints a painting, he should be, feel like a criminal committing an act. And that's true. Every act of creation creates the universe going forward. Not just painting, but your thoughts, your beliefs, your assumptions. And that's why this show, The Velocity of Now, will not be fair porn. It'll be anything but that. We'll be putting the speedometer on and sometimes applying the brakes on this amazing breakthrough into the next level of human evolution. Remember, you see, a lot of people seem to think the whole thing is about they just have to wait for the shift to happen. Well, evolution doesn't work for that. And human beings do not shift to the next level just by sitting around imagining it or, or feeling sorry for themselves or wishing for fantasy sky fairies to come and save them. Stanley Kubrick in 2001 demonstrated that quite clearly that the evolution of man began when the creative intention of the proto-human picked up the bone and realized it could be a tool or a weapon to gain control of the water hole that was stolen from them by a more kind of psychopathic proto-human culture. And then that was a lesson that thuggery and psychopathology doesn't really win the day. What wins the day is creative intentions and manifesting a new reality, both for yourself and for others, because ultimately this is a battle we fight inside. It doesn't happen 
through a th- teamwork. That's that's the myth they put they foisted upon us. They want us to externalize ourselves to everything but what we really are. The the incredible creative machine that each and every one of us is. They've taken that from us by constantly having us externalizing our hopes on organizations, political parties, patriotism, religions, gangs, teams, cults, and even cultural groupings. You know, they make you, they don't call you fans fans for nothing. They wanted to make you fanatics of certain performers, musicians and film stars and so on. And that's why they fill our lives with this nonsense, these merchants of nonsense. As I said, my website is thomassheridanarts.com. If you go through there, you will find the link. There's a PayPal donate button there. Now, I'm not begging. I'm actually working here because consider me like a, uh, a busker on the street. If you can throw a few shekels in the box, that would be great because it takes a lot of time and an effort to put a show like this together and particularly an awful lot of research and it's distracting and taken from other things. I don't make much as a as a writer and I make very little as an artist and I'm probably going to make an awful lot less after what I say about Charles Satchi tonight. But uh, so if you can help out any way you can, I really appreciate that because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a poor artist in a bankrupt country and if you can help keep the show on the air so I don't have to go work in a supermarket or something like that I'd absolutely love that so thank you very much for that so where do we begin well the first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about Tony Rochford in case you don't know who Tony Rochford is he's a he's a, he's a, a remarkably brave man who's gone on a hunger strike over the Irish government's taxes particularly the household tax policy, which is, it's not anything other than money being taken from the Irish people to keep Irish politicians and bankers out of jail. That's all it is. And although Tony is perfectly justified in what he's doing, I really am worried for the man because I think he's around the 20 day mark now. And this is a, this is a very dangerous thing because even if he, if he quits the hunger strike from this point going forward, he's at the point now where he could do permanent renal damage to his kidneys and his liver. And I would hate to see that happen to the man because, to be frank, you know, dying for these bastards, these politicians, it's it's just not worth it. Then they're not worth that. I, I wouldn't piss on any of them if they were on fire. That, that's how I feel about them, and I certainly wouldn't die for them. And. I know why Tony's doing it. He's he's a brave man who's bringing a lot of attention to an issue that the suffering that people are having around this country. There's been God knows how many suicides of people who can't afford to you know take care of their families anymore. And Tony is the embodiment of that, and we thank him for it. But hopefully this will have a happy ending because at the end of the day, we need warriors like Tony to be living warriors and not dead heroes. And it's really despicable and disgusting, but hardly surprising how the the Irish mainstream media have completely ignored this story. Uh, and well, the University of London, you know, in their evolutionary psychology department, found out that journalism, and in particular newspaper journalism, was one has one of the highest rates of psychopathology of any profession. So, if you have correspondent journalist editor, senior editor, sub-editor after your name, the chances of you being a psychopath is far higher than it is with just any other profession, with the exception of the legal profession. But we, are, we, we, we shouldn't start stereotype people by saying if they're in these professions, they're psychopaths. But I'm just saying it's not surprising they don't care because they wouldn't see the humanity. They, they'd be more interested in covering a visit to Dublin by a, a British supermodel, topless model or soccer player's, or, or, or some soccer player's wife buying shoes somewhere in a shop on Grafton Street. This is what we're dealing with. They constantly create distractions. When the Anglo-Irish bank tapes came out this week about that showed the, the bankers actually joking about sneaking the uh, sneaking the IMF bankruptcy deal on the Irish people in order to save their own backsides, we were given an insight into the psychopathology of corporate culture and what, 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 you know, what it does to human beings and where it brings us. And of course, the media had to come in and play their part. And just as just as public anger was really starting to simmer up, 
the Irish mainstream media created a ridiculous story about a rugby player who was dropped from the from the squad. And it had it was deliberately done in such a histrionic OTT way to forget to make people forget about the Anglo tapes. But it's not going to work because the people are waking up. They're, they're, they may not be walking down the street with bullhorns shouting and so on, but what they are doing is they're sitting at home and they know that things are up. And so, Tony, you know, if you're listening to this, your friends are listening to this, you, you know, you look after yourself and, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but, you know, stay alive, brother, because that's what we need you alive more than dead. So that's Tony Rochford. Check him out on Facebook and, and show him your support because, uh, you know, we, we need people with principle these days that can actually do things. So let me recap on recent events in my life that's gone on. I uh, Before the show started, before the Velocity of Now came up with the idea, I just did a speaking tour in England, and it was a, it was a great speaking tour. I had really great crowds, wonderful people, fabulous response, and it was a lot of fun. And it was also very reassuring. And the reason why it was reassuring was because at some of the venues, some of the groups I spoke to, particularly Leicester and in Birmingham, I'd been there before, actually 20 months ago, I think, prior. It was just as puzzling people, my first book had come out. And uh, although, you know, apart from the fact that the crowds had grown enormously since I was there, that was wonderful to see that. The, uh, the attitude of the people had changed, and for the better. I can remember when I first went there, there was still quite a lot of people in those groups who were in the kind of uh, shocked, early waking up stage, the fearful stage, the understandably paranoid stage when you suddenly realize the world is run by psychopaths and you suddenly want to take care of yourself and your friends and you have this explosion, this kind of wake up and it becomes almost evangelical. You want to, You want to save the world noble intentions but the world isn't always ready to hear you say these things so that, that's that when i got there two years ago these, a lot of people there had this kind of mentality they were still searching still looking still going through the sort of youtube research stage looking for answers as many do and they weren't really finding them there was there you could see there was a look a look of kind of collective shock in many people's face this time when i came back the transformation was remarkable. There was a, a complete change in people's faces. Everyone had seemed to have settled into their groove. Some had taken an interest in law, the legal profession. Others had taken an interest in public trusts. Many others had decided to use their creative abilities, write songs, play music, paint pictures, in order to uh, deal with this, this change. This is what I believe is actually a, a shift in human consciousness. We're actually evolving here. And uh, this is a this is highly important because it shows a sense of confidence. That's what I was seeing in people's faces. Not only were their eyes brighter, the bigger smiles, but they were actually confident. And they were confident because we're getting through this. The initial stagnation and terror, this sort of paralysis of anxiety that overcomes people when they first wake up is shifting. And they're not being let into the traps as much as they used to be by, you know, fear jocks and cults and gurus who capitalize on people's idealism and good intentions. They're looking for their own answers, but they're working together naturally. They're coming together in a, a creative and organic way. Nobody is forcing them to work together. No one is forcing anybody to join groups, clubs, teams religions or sex or anything, what they're doing is they're actually falling fa falling into each other's sphere of influence and uh, organically creating something that's really beautiful. And that was a that was a huge uh, uplifting sensation for me. I came back from England absolutely buzzing just because I've seen that the you know it's underway. We're you know we're we're not this alternative movement. We're not the losers that they thought we were. We're not the the you know the the hysterical you know easily controlled morons that they they tried to make out we were we've stood the test of time and now they're getting frightened and this is why they're trying to co-opt and own the alternative movement 
This is what they want. They want it. This is what they always do. They always do this. This is why culture is so important. What they always do is if something really cha- threatening or challenging to the status quo, the cushy little system comes up. The first thing they do is they, they make fun of it. Oh, conspiracy theorist. Oh, whack job. Oh, kook. You know, that kind of thing. And then the next thing that happens is they get vicious. They start viciously attacking. They, they really start attacking people. They will call, you know, they will start sending their shields in. And believe me, this movement, particularly in the UK, is a, it has an infection of malignant shills, mostly from a sort of stately home socialist backgrounds, fake lefty groups who are infiltrating and trying to steer this, uh, steer the alternative movement back to where they wanted, ultimately feeding the mainstream parties with the same old globalist agenda. And that's not working either. Now they're trying to co-opt it. They're trying to put together a, a sense of, oh well, you're you're welcome in now, you know. And don't be don't be fooled or deceived by this thing where you see, you know, mainstream figures suddenly, you know, being all very, you know, cozy and and lovey dovey towards us. This is, may well be a trap. In fact, I, I'm pretty sure it is. That doesn't mean anyone who's sincere, or so, anyone who seems sincere, who is a star talking about this stuff. It, 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 you know, is, is is bullshitting us. They could be very sincere. I actually think people like Russell, Russell Brand, Brand, sorry, Brand, <laughs> Russell, Russell Brand, and we, you know, Morrissey and Johnny Rotten. The, I think these people are, are sincere, straight up people. And uh, thank God we have them because it's been a long time since we've had a Bill Kicks or a, a George Carlin. So uh, that's good news for us. We're actually, you know, on that level, winning people of influence that can actually help this movement. But, just, um, but on the other hand, they're going to send in the shills, the big time shills, the corporate shills, the uh, the political shills, to try and get this, this movement back to where they want it. Just like they did with Occupy. Occupy was obviously a ruse. Uh, I knew that immediately from just seeing the signs that people were handing out, in, particularly in New York, uh, Occupy movement. They were holding up very snazzy, classy looking signs that had the usual globalist mantras on them, like, you know, global climate change tax now, this kind of nonsense. And it's not working for them. So this we have to keep, you know, keep focus on the road ahead. Do not be distracted by lovey-dovey, mushy, superficial festivals that, like, make you believe that you're, you know, you've suddenly arrived and, you know, the, the globalists inside the hotel are, are, are bricking it because they're terrified you're outside. No, they're actually laughing at you. That's what they're doing. They create a distraction. You walked into it, and that's the end of it. This is how they are. This is how psychopaths think, and this is the games they play. And we have to get used to this. We have to not fall for these things. If anyone from, you know, the mainstream media is involved in these things or some kind of like uh, state sanctioned, you know, dissident organizations, you're, you're being led into a trap. And that's just the end of it. I'm not saying the people who were there, you know, did anything wrong or they were, you know, they're all shills or anything like that. I'm just saying we have to be careful of this stuff because they're, they're going to get more and more sneaky and devious. If you look on my website, there's an article about these these shills in the movement, and you know it's a good, still good to go to these festivals. It's still good to go to these events. They don't achieve anything. Protesting, as you know, you can see that in Egypt, protesting achieves absolutely nothing. They never will achieve anything. But it's good for networking, so that's why we still should do it. It's good for networking. It's good for gauging the reaction of the control system, but it's also very good for spotting shills, and that's something we really have to get you know, really get big time on. We have to get start monitoring these people who come into the movement and suddenly become stars very quickly. You know, the trustafarian types with the, you know, the dreadlock wigs and so on. We've got to really start, you know, looking at these people and asking who they are. And some people out there are doing it and good luck to them. That's great. But we all have to be like this and we all have to be very, doesn't mean we have to be, you know, paranoid, anything like that. It doesn't have to be that. Just exercise regular caution and ask questions, you know, don't become sheeple 2.0. Just because you've reached this stage, don't get locked into it. Continue to be cynical, critical, and aware. In other news, I have a film that came out that was made with myself and Mark Higginbotham called The End of an Era. Mark approached me about three or four months ago Although I knew Mark from, he's a poet here in Ireland, and we, we, you know, we were kind of got to know each other. 
and he said, "Would you be interested in talking to a camera?" And I said, "Yeah, I'd do it if uh, if I'm allowed to say what I want. I'm allowed to tax, you know, not attack, but like point a finger at sacred cows." And do it in such a way that it's not just an Irish story, but it could be sold anywhere because the issues within the film, contained within the film, are, you know, they're relevant to the whole world. We're all, we're being attacked, you know, all over the world by the same, you know, weapon. That that weapon is globalism. And they'll just go into each country, just like the Romans did, because this is what we're dealing with, the same system. When the Romans went into into a, 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 say a pagan society, all they did was they co-opted the the local pagan gods and brought them into the you know the Roman Church, like Saint Bridget in Ireland. She was Bridget. She was a you know a pagan deity, and this happened all over the world. This is how you know Christianity, which isn't really Christianity, it's Roman imperialist theocracy, was spread, and they're doing the same thing all the time just locally but now they do it with cultural issues so they'll go into a country and they'll find the country's cultural you know not idiosyncrasy but their cultural individuality and then they'll co-opt it for globalist aims and the politicians will do it for the same reason it doesn't mean that the cultural or the indigenous kind of uh, you know systems are wrong it just means that they will be polluted and used to sell globalist ideas and so I said, I'll make the film, with, I told Mark, I'd make the film for that reason. If you, you know, if we can sell something that's, that helps people in Ireland understand what's been done to them. Because this country has been unbelievably screwed by some real nasty pieces of work. And it had been planned for about 10 to 15 years. And, and they, they were, this was a deliberate implosion in order to do a robbery. That's all that was going on here. They were monitored, they were like... The globalists were like criminal thugs who were monitoring a, a, whole, a house and waiting for the right time in order to break in. And that's what they did with the IMF bailout. And I wanted to explain in clear terms how it was done, but also how we could get out of it. And we get out of it by the same way you deal with a psychopathic individual who's come into your life, no contact ever again. So End of an Era has, it's only been about a week up, and it already has something like, uh, Something like it's going on. I think it's going on six thousand views, and that's good because that that's a decent count for uh, you know a, a small film in Ireland, and especially one that's like you know nearly an hour and a half long. But if you could get the film and spread it everywhere, because it's the first time I think that our national TV station RT has been actually been challenged. They won't even get challenged by the independent TV stations because it's a small system. A small TV network in Ireland, and so if you're in one of the independent TV stations, you're not going to knock the big boy because you may go looking for a job there one day. So in some ways, RT are actually more insidious in that sense than the BBC. And this is the first time I think anyone has really thrown down the gauntlet to them and pointed the finger at them and, and, and showed that this emperor really has got a stitch of clothes and it's just a propaganda service for the government. So if you can continue to share the film, The End of an Era, if you haven't seen it, check it out. I think it's actually quite, it's well worth watching because the tools are in there, are useful for everyone in every country. So that's The End of an Era. And I want to uh, introduce the first song now. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to get better at this. I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit nervous. This is my first time. So be gentle with me. Be you know, I'm a delicate flower that needs that needs compassion, and you know, I need I need that, you know. So uh, the first song we're going to play is "Summer Leaves" by Sonicadia, and this is one of the this is the first song that's been picked out of the the kitty or the the selection of tunes. So if the producers can put that on. This is "Summer Leaves" by Sonicadia. <laughs> Summer leaves are falling The autumn trees are gone The winter breeze is calling I will keep you from the cold Summer's promises And 
when the skies are filled with rain, it seeps in your soul. Sadness weeps inside again. I will keep you. Summer's promises will hold. May the skies fall down and all the seas run dry. The seeds of time may all drown if I. In the sweet by the night And if the night should fall too soon Before your dreams unfold And if the shadows Summer's promises will hold And if your eyes should close, my dear And the ocean tides on And of course I messed that up. That was not Summer Leaves by Sonic Hay. That was Summer Leaves by Mervyn Frost. I'm sorry, Mervyn. Uh, blame the producers. Uh, I will have them all shot. Uh, I'm very sorry about this. That was Summer Leaves by Mervyn Frost. Well, you know, I told you I was a virgin and I, you know, I, I haven't got the experience yet. So, you know, you know, I shot my load too early or something. But anyway... You know, what was that song by Take That? It only takes a minute, girl. Well, that was me just then. It took me 30, 30, it took me 30 minutes. But anyway, we'll get this sorted out. That was Summer Leaves by Mervyn Frost. Uh, that was the first song. Actually, now that we've now that I've messed up, I actually feel a lot more relaxed. Uh, apparently, I have a caller on the air. Uh, can the, Steve, could you put that through if the caller is there? Yep. Namaste. Um, Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Who who's this? It's our good friend Swami Shivananda Giri, another type one artiste. Well, you should have told me he was a Swami because I was going to add something else else after Namaste. But you know, hi Swami, how are you? Doing very very well. Very happy to hear you on the Type One Network, and uh, well, looking forward to all that you bring to the table in your very special way. Well, thank you for that. Uh, likewise, the same for you. So what time is your show on it, so people will know? Um, let's see. Uh, GMT, it would be 9 p.m., so same time except on Fridays. On Fridays, yeah. Well, so that's 9, 9 p.m. on US, Fridays. Yeah, here in the U.S., it would be Friday at 4 Eastern time. Three central, 
two mountain, and one Pacific. Great. Well, thank you for and that calling. That show is uh, called Meditative Living. What's it called again? Meditative Living. Meditative Living. Okay. So Meditative Living every Friday at 9 GMT or whatever that is around the world. Right. So uh, th- thank you very much for that, Swami. Thanks for calling in. I appreciate Oops, your good words and, and your uh, your kind comments. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay. So as I said, that song we had is Summer Leaves by Mervyn Frost. Sorry about that, Mervyn. But, you know, at least you got played. That's good news. Now, that's thrown off my train of thought here. But uh, yes, what did I say? I was talking about the end of an era in the film. And I mentioned creativity. And let me get a book here. I want to read a passage from a book because this is a... If you haven't read this book, you should really get it. It's called The Courage to Create by Rollo May. That's R-O-L-L-O. M-A-Y is a second name. The book came out in the, in the 60s, I think, 68 or something like that. And it's absolutely brilliant. It's the best book on creativity I've, I think I've read. But uh, the, the, the copy I have here is, fall, is years old and falling apart. But I want to read this one passage on the creative process. And it kind of sums up everything. And this is, uh, he goes on to say, The first thing we notice in a creative act is that it is an encounter. Artists encounter the landscape they propose to paint. They look at it, observe it from that this angle and that angle. They are, as we say, absorbed in it. Or in the case of abstract painters, the encounter may be with an idea, an inner vision, that in turn may be led off by brilliant colours on the palette or the inviting rough whiteness of the canvas. The paint, the canvas, and the other materials then become a secondary part of this encounter. They are the language of it, the media, as we rightly put it. Or scientists confront their experiment, their laboratory task, in a similar situation or encounter. The encounter may or may not involve voluntary effort. That is willpower. A healthy child's play, for example, also has the essential features of an encounter. And we know it is one of the most important prototypes of adult creativity. The essential point is not that the presence or absence of voluntary effort, but the degree of absorption, the degree of intensity. There must be a specific quality of engagement. And that final word there, quality, is very, very important. Because it's not quality in terms of the proficiency of the creative process. It's not quality in terms of the superiority or the superior ability of the artist or the creator over other people, but the quality in terms of how it emanates from within a person and within the creator. Because once it's pure, once it comes directly from source, then it has a high quality. It doesn't matter if it's done by a tribesperson living in the banks of the Amazon with paint or soot and clay. It doesn't matter if it's done by somebody who has access to a large installation piece with all the resources and money to put it together. It doesn't matter. Once the quality of it is there, that's what really matters. And that's why, you know, particularly in European cities, we pass by hundreds, if not thousands, of large monuments, perfectly sculptured figures that celebrate the trappings of the state of war. And we hardly notice them. We hardly notice them because they have no quality in them. They were tools of propaganda co-opted by the state. They were tools of propaganda co-opted by corporations and shoved into our faces. There is no quality because they weren't produced by someone who had a qualitative aspect to their nature, to their creative intention. And even if they did, it was bought off them or taken away from them by their benefactors. A couple of years ago, there was a, a, bit, a bit of a hubbaloo here in Ireland about the Arts Council cut off grants to artists, and I kind of made an enemy, an enemy of many people in the arts movement here by publicly announcing that I didn't want any government grants. And I was very disappointed that so many artists in Ireland felt that the only way they could actually be an artist is as if they could, you know, 
have a be a government employee of some form. And if you get a grant off the government, you're automatically working for the man. I don't care what your creativity is. You automatically have sold out to a certain degree. I understand that people have bills to pay and so on, but what, when do you stop being an artist and when do you start being a propagandist? Because if you go into art galleries all over the world, they're the same. You see the same kind of the same kind of crap, ridiculous, absurdist installations for the most part, shoved in your face where the concept behind it is actually more important than the actual piece of art is in terms of its qualitative nature. A lot of it is just politically correct muck. I often believe that uh, people who are particularly politically correct are, are actually lack a soul on some level. That's why they're obsessed with finding racist, misogynists, homophobes around every corner because there's something deeply wrong with them that puts this witch hunt mentality within them. They just can't live and, and let live. Or they, they, for some reason they have to be celebrated as heroes and the arts are now filled with that kind of thing because it's been pushed in our face that way it's been pushed in our face that way by people like Charles Satchi now anyone who's been following the news lately knows or anyone who's following my work for a long time knows um, he's not one of my favourite people he is the Simon Cowell of the art scene it should not be up to some advertising executive who put one of the greatest fascists in Western democracy in, in power, Margaret Thatcher, to decide who and who shouldn't be the next big star of art, particularly in the UK. But the, the London art scene is so powerful that it, it resonates all over the world. Now, I don't like talking about people's private lives. I just don't do that kind of thing unless it comes out in the papers. But in, in the case of what happened with Charles Saatchi, especially now it's come out today that he's using some noble excuse for a divorce and from Nigella Lawson, who he was pictured holding by the neck in, in a very disturbing and aggressive manner in a restaurant in London a couple of weeks ago. We've actually got an insight to what, what's really behind the slick and the, you know, the, the image that these people present to the world. For all his money and for all his wealth and for all his power, he was still basically a thug who was assaulting his wife. That's just the end of it. And the method and the manner in which he was grabbing her neck was particularly interesting to me because it seemed that it was almost like he was trying to shut her down, shut down her mouth, close off her windpipe, close off her vocal cords. And that's really where Nigella Lawson's real talent belongs. I know she's beautiful and she's like, a, you know, on TV, she's always pouting and, and wiggling her bum and all that stuff. And she cooks food and, and so on. But that's not really the reason why I think people like her. I think they like her because there's a real sincerity in her voice. There's something about Nigella Lawson that when she speaks, she comes across as being very real. There's, some, there's a real depth there. There's a very strong maternal resonance within her voice. And apparently, allegedly, we'll never know, that the argument was about the children. And apart from the look on her face, which seemed horrific and terrifying, this was, you know, she was driven to that extreme to protect her children. And he went for her throat and he went for her in a, in a way to almost like stop her from being who she is. Now, I'm not going to accuse Charles Satchi of being any particular kind of personality disorder. That's not for me to do. But I wouldn't want this guy to, I wouldn't ask this guy for the time of day. I think I'm probably the, and, and you know, this is another thing I want to bring up. I think I'm probably the only artist that has a kind of a profile, even though it's very small, that's actually coming out and going after Charles Satchi because I'm quite surprised at how many of these politically correct, otherwise mouthy, Balchi artist have all kept stum and said nothing about what happened with Sachi and his wife for the simple reason that they do not want to cut off a future payday. And ultimately, is not what they're really interested in. They're, they're quite willing to turn their eyes, look away from what's going on and say nothing about it because they're dependent on this, this sort of latter-day, you know, Quasimodo de Michi to put their art on display. And I, I say, shame on them. Shame on you. Don't you dare, you know, 
produce installations or paintings in future making commentaries about the plight of women in the Islamic world or in Africa or any other superficial platitude regarding a politically correct issue where you're quite willing to take money off a guy who was obviously assaulting his wife in public. So you're a fake and you're a phony and you know you are. And if you want to get paid to be like that, and it's good luck to you, but don't don't call yourself an artist. You're not an artist. You're a prostitute. Now, you know we all want to get paid for our creations. We all want to make money for it. But there's you know there's a limit for it. There are artists who made posters for the Third Reich, for Pol Pot, and for other genocidal maniacs around the world. And that's not art. That's that's not the purpose of it. The the actual purpose of a creative moment is the, the moment in which that creation is made. The moment in which that creation is formulated. When there's absolutely no distinction or no break between the creator and the pen in their hand, the word processor, the paintbrush and the canvas, the chisel and the, and the stone. Or the the poet and the words. It's just, that's, that's it. That's where the magic lies. In that moment, that flash, that spark of creativity. To bring that home, there's a phenomenal book. It's actually one of the few books on the Druids that's, that's worth reading. It was written as actually a Penguin paperback from the 60s again. It's funny how so many of the books I like seem to be from the 60s, just like the movies. It's called The Druids by Stuart Piggott. And it's a, you know, it's very difficult to find information on the Druids that uh, is is credible because unfortunately all, it's nearly all propaganda you're dealing with from the Romans or the Greeks, particularly the Romans, and they had a vested interest in dehumanizing the Druids because they ultimately committed genocide against them. There is uh, there's some very good information on the Druids that can be culled from the the Gaelic annals, which are about seven eight hundred years old, and they would have been like. The Vedic traditions in India, they were originally passed down as oral repositories and stories, and they were finally written down in the Middle Ages, and they're actually an excellent insight into life, if you read between the lines, of what Druidic and what they would call Celtic cultures, but we know the Celts weren't really, didn't really exist, Gaelic culture at that time. And also archaeology is very useful, very, very useful for making us understand, to get inside the heads of people in a good way, to understand their lives, their hopes, their dreams, their wishes, and how they used to think about things. And the Druids had a very interesting idea of art because they absolutely knew that the moment of creativity was the moment of creativity, not the aftermath, not the, the gain from it, not even perhaps even you know the audience, but the actual spark of the creative process and there's these things called votive deposits. They're ritual shafts that have been found mostly in France, but all over Europe from the time of the Druids. And they have these intricately carved statues that these they used to carve and then bury them. That's all they did. They buried them. They used to create quite ornate and intricate works of art and then bury them, inter them in shafts. And these shafts had a kind of a a chronological and sort of sociological hierarchy where objects of the most importance were buried at the bottom and objects of the least importance were buried at the top. And at the top of the shafts, they would often find ornamental and very expensive works of art made in gold and other precious metals. And at the bottom, they would find these sort of most like crude statues, very interesting. Some of them actually look like you know, grey aliens or something. They're very they're very strange actually, a lot of these statues. But they're they're figures carved in wood and they're at the bottom of the, the shafts, of these ritual shafts, which show that they had a greater value in a in a consciousness sense, not a monetary sense, than the jewels and the gold at the top of the shaft. That's because the actually were the purest one to source in terms of creativity. There was just one person with a knife carving a figure. And it was that moment of creativity of carving the figure is what created the magic and hence why the Druids and similar cultures like the Celts and the Gauls valued these things so highly. They understood the real power of creativity. This is why jams, musical jams, are so incredible 
compared to a highly produced pop song. You could listen to a highly produced pop record in the charts today, and it's it's absolutely awful. And then you can hear a couple of kids on the street banging drums and doing freestyle hip hop, and it's absolutely magical. And that's because you're witnessing the power of creativity. And this is why Charles Dutchie and people like that are not my favorite kinds of uh, individuals. And it's an interesting thing that, like, they want to control art. They they so badly want to control all creativity because they know the power of it. They always have to, going back to the time of the Greeks, going back, that's why the Greeks filled their world with amphitheaters. So I Plato understood the power of these things. I went into depth detail in this in my book, The Anvil of the Psyche, and how they played on these archetypes that are very deep within the human subconsciousness. The idea of the star, the celebrity, the Dionysian cults brought into the modern age. We don't need Dionysian cults when we're you know, involved in the creative process. We don't need superstars. What we need is quality. Quality that emanates from the heart. This is why I think children's, you know, paintings and hand paintings are so important. I was staying with this woman in a, in Hull recently when I was doing a talk up there and her two teenage daughters showed me their artwork and she thought they were bothering me, but I was absolutely loving every minute of it because it was just so refreshing to see honest art. Honest art from, you know, the, the young minds of young people coming through. And I'm seeing a lot more of that. I'm seeing a lot more young people who are definitely more creative in a sort of a qualitative sense than when I was a teenager. There seems to be, again, uh, we're on this evolutionary cusp of change. And just like in the cave paintings at Lacau in France, when that was, they were painted on the cusp of the evolutionary change of humans in terms of our development of language, ritual, and other, you know, modern aspects we come to consider, there is happening it again. It's almost like we in the awakened community were almost a kind of a a guide, a valet. We woke up at a certain period. We tend to be around a certain age, between the 30s and, and 60s. And we're, we're setting the stage now for the next generation to come along and begin this breakthrough. And that was our job. Our job was to appear in order to smash down the walls of fake fakery, smash down the walls of dogma and conformity. It began in the 60s with the music industry, the music, the bands, I mean, and it's worked its way, its way through the punk rock movement and all the changes in art and poetry and everything else. We've, we've, smashed, it, we've smashed it down. We're breaking it down and we've created a blank canvas for the next generation to add their aspect to the story. And we played a very important part in this. And you hear so many people say in this community, when are we going to wake up? When is the world going to wake up? When are we going to have this shift? Well, that's the same thing as an artist who creates a work of art and only interest in when they're going to sell it. That's not how it works at all. We've actually found ourselves trapped in the creative moment. And for that, we are a blessed generation. You know, we've actually, we've seen the, the river, we found the river that leads to the ocean. We may not be the ones to get there, but others who will follow us will be the ones to get there. But we found the way, we are the pathfinders. We are the ones who have the magic of that creative moment of waking up. And now we have to just watch and nurture and guide the future generations forward. We're almost like the modern shaman. In fact, I, I believe that's what we are. I believe, you know, I've often, I've often spoken about this, but Joseph Campbell said that the, the problem with modern man is that our, our mythology has failed to keep up with our changes in technology. And there was a, a deficiency, a redundancy between who we are, how we see ourselves, and where we're heading. Well, I believe this alternative awakening movement was exactly that. We, we were almost like the the breaks that were applied to the rapid changes in, in the world and went, hold on, no, 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 we don't like this transhumanism. Where are you going with this stuff? GMOs, forget about that. Excuse me? You know, what's the relationship between Monsanto and the U.S. administration? 
we this is an amazing time that we're living in we're the we're the ones who are actually seeing that seeing it for what it is and we're guiding the next generation forward and we're we're opening the way we're giving them the tools to actually take the system and the psychopaths down i have no